those who are ready. So this is uh, Miracles in Manhattan. This is uh, May of 2016. We started this in May of 2013. Uh, the idea was to go chapter by chapter, one chapter per month through the entire Course of Miracles. We're almost done. Uh, we will be done in June. And just to let you know what's coming after that, uh, in July, uh, my friend Dr. Rod Schelberg, who is uh, an MD, who is in charge of three nursing homes and a hospice center up in Maine, uh, who is a devout student of A Course in Miracles, uh, who prays with his patients, sees auras, meditates uh, uh, daily, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Wonderful, very humble, but uh, great guy. Anyhow, he's going to be here. We're going to share the day, and we're going to be talking about eternal life. Right. Is that in June or July? That's June. No, that's July. I'm sorry. Yeah, July. Yeah, June we finished the book. July, June we finished chapter 31. All right. Uh, then in the August, we're vacation time. September, we're going to start a new series uh, that I'm going to call uh, Manifesting Miracle Mindedness. And I'm just going to find different topics rather than going serially through the book or anything else. And it's interesting, the September date is 9-11. Okay, it just so happens that it's 9-11, and here we are uh, very near where the major catastrophe occurred. And... Um, one of the other things that I'm going to start doing is having a few more guests come to also share with you and speak with you. And so for that day, the topic is going to be healing the terrorist within, or healing, healing the air within. And Amy Torres, who uh, many of you know is a teacher here, was a teacher here in New York City. She now is a teacher of the course out in California is going to share that day with me. She's going to come and we're going to work together. And I'm going to continue to, to do that. We have Francis is going to speak to us uh, beginning in about an hour from now, from around a quarter or four uh, on for a while today. I'll introduce her more formally in a minute. A few other announcements, first of all, regarding uh, what's going on right now. Mark, uh, Lorende, do you want to make some announcements? Yeah, yeah, use the mic. Yeah, no, it's not. No, I it is. love the daily exercise of figuring out if the microphone is on or not. Hey, it's so great to see all of you. Um, we have a very, very special program. Um, the first weekend in June, Friday um, after an evening, Saturday all day and Sunday all day. It's with Lorindy Roos and with John. Um, it's called Out of the Matrix. We have um, Reverend Tony Semp. Say his name correctly. Pretty good. And Chris Loritig. Okay. Um, that are coming. Uh, they're out of town speakers. Um, it's usually $4.99. Um, it will be $3.99 for everyone in this group who's a member of John's group. And we would just really encourage all of you to come if you can. It really will be an amazing, amazing event. So thank you. Okay, great. Oh, the sign-up sheets are over on the right hand, your left hand side over there. So this is an intensive training program. I mean, can you consider that it's not only Friday evening, all day Saturday, and all day uh, Sunday. It's uh, something I support because I've seen them work, and I know that they have a way of getting in there and getting to the root of things that need to be dealt with in terms of uh, our own responsibility, our own lack of responsibility. And although I'll be there, uh, it's really uh, Tony and Chris that are, are the major leaders for, for the event. I'm not gonna, I may not even be there all the time. I'll be there to start, but that's, that's for sure. Right? right here? Yes, right here. 
okay? <clears throat> First weekend in June. Many of you have probably never met my, my wife, uh, Dolores. Uh, Dolores is not a student of the Course in Miracles. We met completely outside of the, the Course in Miracles which shows those of you who are maybe married to non-Course in Miracles or relationships with, it's perfectly possible. There's no reason why you can't do it. Um, but uh, she has to, by necessity, sit and listen to me a lot when we travel. Uh, so in a lot of ways, it's kind of uh, worn off. And uh, she's the, her favorite passage from the Course, back when the... Our daughter, Sarah, gave birth to uh, Bryson here. We went through what we're, I kind of think of as the terrible teens. And during that time, um, her favorite passage in the course is, let her be what, who she is. <laughs> Seek not to make of love an enemy. Actually, the Course in Miracles says, let him be who he is. And seek not to make of love an enemy. Right? That's one of the hardest things for us to do, actually, is to leave people alone. And, and let them grow up uh, kind of in their own, in their own way. So um, let me go on. I want to talk about, uh, if any of you, you know about the, this, I have been talking about this for the longest time. I've been waiting for this movie to come out. It's been 10 years in production, largely because it took so about six years to raise the funds to, to do it. This is called... The Man Who Knew Infinity, it was just, it's just been released. And my wife and I, for my birthday present on Friday night, went out to, to see it. And I want to tell you a little bit about this story, and I really highly encourage all of you to, to go see this. I want it's a, my book, it's a five star, for multiple reasons. Anyhow, he's played by Deva Patal. Do you know who played in Slumdog Millionaire? The, 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 oh, yeah. heaven, right? And... Uh, the guy in the background here, this is uh, Jeremy Irons, but it was, uh, he plays Professor Hardy from Oxford University. So here's the story, which is really the, the, the interesting story behind the thing. Ramanjan was a mathematical genius, self-taught, who was born in the 1880s. He died at the age of 32, and so he only had a very, very short life. Uh, he came up with all of these mathematical theorems. Uh, he sent them off to these couple professors at Oxford. One of them sort of poo pooed the whole thing. The other one says, no, there's really something here. And they were not able to disprove any of the theorems that he came up with. They invited him to come to uh, Oxford uh, to maybe become a fellow at Oxford. This is no formal education at all, right? And um, none of his th 3,900 theorems, none of them disproved. But what he would do is he would come up with the answer to the theorem, but without the proof. <laughs> and so they insisted that the professors, he had to have the proof, right? It was clear the answer was right, but he didn't have the proof. So he would... To satisfy them, he came up with the proofs as well to explain how the whole process worked. Um, when they pressed him <clears throat> to say, "Where? how did you do this? How did you get these answers, right? And he was reluctant to tell them, but he finally said, well, God gave them to me. God told me, right? And so there's a whole thing in the, the movie, there's a very interesting uh, dialogue between Hardy and he on um, intuition and just being given uh, the, the knowledge. But he, he, it also, he understood it. I mean, it's a, understand this incredible detail, complicated things that no one could be. He's living at exactly, he's writing at exactly the same time as Einstein, which is sort of interesting, right? But he found God through mathematics, is what we're, what we're getting at. So he is, to mathematics, I think what Helen Schuchman was to A Course in Miracles. By that, I simply mean they had the right kind of a mind to be able to receive. And mathematics, you know, is pure. I mean, it, it, it gets the truth. We're talking about the truth here. In fact, I found this cartoon. I wish I had a, 
uh, been able to get it into our slides this week. Uh, it shows a couple of people standing looking at a blackboard and there's this complicated formula on the, the blackboard that they're looking at and the caption underneath is, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> so it's funny because it's true. It's true, you know, and, it's, and the, the, the Course in Miracles says that this whole Course thing got, uh, the whole illusion thing really got started when the Son of God remembered not to laugh. <laughs> so we should have laughed at the really silly, ridiculous idea that it's possible to be separated from God. It can, it's not possible to be separated from God, right? But uh, depending on how you want to view historical time, for the past tens of thousands of years or more, several billion of us have been trying to think a thought outside of the mind of God, which makes us very unhappy. So what actually what this whole chapter 30 is about is about trying to help us, once again, I've said many times before, that the purpose of the Course is to help us to get, to realign the mind back with the mind. <laughs> understanding it is very, very helpful. That's what the Course is for. The Course is for helping us to understand. That's, that's the formula. That's the process. That's the, 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 but in this case, we're dealing with psychology, not with uh, mathematics, right? But we're understanding how the mind works. Actually, we're understanding not how it works. We're understanding what went wrong <laughs> with our thinking, right? It's, it's the mind having gone wrong, having come up with the wrong formula, the wrong idea. And the wrong idea, again, is that it's possible to, be, to break off. So our basic problem in that sense is the problem of, of arrogance, uh, that we think that we could... Uh, outdo God, you know, that we can leave me alone, God, I'll, I'll handle it myself, I'll figure it out for myself. And God says, fine, go ahead, try. <laughs> you know? But knowing that it's not going to work and knowing that eventually we'll turn around and we'll come back home and we'll, we'll say that you were right all along. So that's a lot of what this particular chapter is about. Um, so let's, uh, let's begin to get into this, okay? Oh, let's go, let's, I'm going to back up a couple. All right, let's go here to first. All right, so what this actually, you probably can't read what that says there. But uh, this is Don Quixote, of course, uh, fighting windmills. And this is Sanchez. You all know that's the famous book by. by? Pancho Panzo. So, yes, his last name is Panzo. Sancho Panzo. Anyhow, his uh, squire on, it, on the donkey. <laughs> And he said, what, what it says there is, wow, would you look at the time I got to run a, uh, good luck with that uh, windmill thing. <laughs> 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 and now let's go to the quote, which goes with this. You always fight illusions. Okay. So what it means when it says we always fight illusions is that we're always putting these uh, ideas out there that we think somehow or another are true, like that somebody else is an idiot. <laughs> Right. One of the main things that this chapter really emphasizes, which Ken Wapnick really emphasized a lot in terms of our understanding the basic problem we have in this world. Isn't it interesting that we're always trying to figure out? We're always trying to figure it out. That what, what are you doing here this afternoon? I mean, what, what we're all doing here is we're trying to figure it out. Right? We're trying to, we want the answer. And the Course in Miracles has the answer. It really has the pure answer. And you can go through the, the workbook and you can read the text and you can, you can figure it out, but you can also kind of intuit it. I mean, you can, you can kind of get it. Every once in a while you'll meet somebody who just kind of uh, comes to the Course and they just be, <clears throat> they're like a duck to water. They just begin to get it right away. It doesn't take a lot of complication for them to understand. It's the practical application of the Course that always hangs us up because to actually to do what it's asking us to do, right? But here we go. You always fight illusions. So illusions are stuff that we make up. And last time we were here, I had a, a quote from uh, Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> along with a picture of Marilyn Monroe, and the, the quote says, it's all make-believe, isn't it? <laughs> and of course it's saying, yeah, it's all make-believe. <clears throat> That's why the world is an illusion which is why, actually, there is no world. 
Because make-believe or fantasy is not reality. What we're really trying to get to is reality. So you always fight illusions. The truth could never be attacked. How could you attack God? <laughs> you know, that's impossible. That, that's what Jesus is doing on the cross. What Jesus is doing on the cross is he's saying, well, the body, you can kill my body. You, that, that's fine. But you, m me, you can't, you can't harm. Right? What it was eternal is eternal. What is true is true. What is everlasting is everlasting. <clears throat> and none of that can be destroyed. Right? Which is a good part of what I'm saying in the, my new book, Eternal Life and the Course of Miracles. You always fight illusions. The truth could never be attacked. And this you knew when you made idols. They were made that this might be forgotten. So there's a lot about idols in this particular chapter. So let's just talk about what an idol is. An idol is anything that's not of God. <clears throat> It's anything that we make more important, uh, whether that be status, uh, whether that be how we are in the community, just whatever it is, whatever it is that's out there that becomes more important. Um, I was giving a talk at a church, I won't say where, when, this was a few years ago in another state, and <clears throat> I was staying with the minister and her husband. So this, uh, the husband was sort of uh, not participated in her church and things, but they, they were married. And at that particular juncture, he had just bought, <clears throat> the few days before I arrived, a $65,000 BMW uh, sports car, which was going to cost him something like $800 a month uh, for the next six years of his life. And you can imagine that she, the, this, the lady was furious <laughs> because they needed the money for other things besides, well, that's an idol, right? So anything that we, that we make really important to us, you've got to have this, whatever this is. Now, in this case, it's a thing that we're talking about. It, it might not be a thing. It might be an idea even, right, that we make into an idol that we then support with all of our, our force, okay? Let's go on. You attack but false ideas and never truthful ones. <clears throat> All idols are the false ideas you made to fill the gap. Now, for those of you who don't know about the gap, we talked about the gap. This is the third time in, in, in chapter 28, 29, and 30 it talks about the gap. The gap is the space that we create between God and ourselves and also between each other so that we maintain the sense of being separate, <clears throat> so that we are not together, so that mind does, but there's something that's blocking our being together. It's something that blocks ourselves from being whole, from being able to see the innocence, to see the, the completion. That's there. Actually, the, the truth is, the Course says, <clears throat> there's no difference between us. There is no separation and there's no break. But we, but we put this stuff in there. So all others are the false ideas you made to fill the gap. So false ideas, we, we put in, we'll fill this, this gap. That keeps me separate from you because you think differently than I do. Right? You're a Democrat or whatever it is, you know, or faith-wise, we can't be together. So we, we have to put something in there to separate us. And you attack, you think them, you, you think arose between you and what is true. You think arose. There's nothing there in truth. When you get right down to it, there is nothing separating us. All right? It's all one. And you attack them for the things you think they represent. What lies beyond them cannot be attacked. Let's go on. So God created, of course, says, the only relationship that has meaning and that is his relationship with you. This is the only relationship that has meaning. So, uh, but we have other relationships. So let's just talk about a few of our other relationships. First of all, the relationship we have with ourselves. So in terms of the course, the kind of question would be, do you like you? <laughs> do you get along with you? Do you complain about you? Do you bitch about you? Do you gripe about do you? Do you call yourself an idiot? Do you, uh, or, you know, <laughs> how, do, how do we see ourselves? 
right? Can you, are you comfortable with yourself? Are you comfortable being alone, etc., right? Then there's the relationship we have, our, have with our bodies. Now, we have a lot of ambig ambiguity about this is the most, in some ways, this is a very special, special relationship we have. The one we have with our body, we hate them. We love them. They're not good enough. They're pretty. They're ugly. They're whatever they are. But, you know, we got all kinds of mixed emotions and feelings that are going on about this particular relationship, which we need to come to peace with, right? To let, it, to let that be what it is to him, and there's a way to be more peaceful with that. And then there's the big one. The really big one is the relationship we have with each other. Because this is really the area in which we can easily find fault. And we easily create problems. Right? So, here's what the Course is. We feel guilty about the fact that we reject others, we feel guilty about a lot of the things that we do in the world, but we bury our guilt. And this is Freud's great discovery, Freud, that we, we, we push everything down, we repress, we deny. One of the main things that Ken talked about a lot, and by the way, you'll hear me talk about Ken a lot. <laughs> okay, he was the major teacher of the Course, no doubt about it, right? Um, is all the stuff that we, we bury and then we don't look at. And the Course is practically begging us to be willing to look at the darkness that's inside ourselves. Because if we don't look and we don't, and we keep pushing it down and we keep burying stuff, we keep lying, we keep hiding, it makes us sick. It makes us really sick. And then the way that it comes out, it comes out. What we push down comes up. So whatever you push down is going to come up. It comes up in two ways. One way is it comes up, it comes up an attack on the world. Okay, so it comes up with projection. As of course, it makes a projection makes perception. So then we, begin, we find fault with the world. It's the Muslims. It's the Mexicans. It's your mother. It's Mary Ann, it's Marvin, it's anybody that starts with M. It's <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. And the Course in Miracles is saying that's never the problem. The problem is never outside of you. It, it, and, and if the mind was in the right place, if, the mind, if you could see with, through Jesus' eyes, then it wouldn't make any difference what you were looking at. You'd be able to love it. And, and not only would you be able to love it, you'd be able to see the, the innocence in it. So we have a new uh, baby in our family, and it's very, very easy to see the innocence in the baby. I mean, it's just 100% innocence. It's all, it's all that there is. It's just a, so it's easy to look at. Now, we know that someday there's the terrible twos coming along, but <clears throat> right now, uh, my wife and daughter, and we all are, uh, with some degree of regularity, uh, falling in love. <laughs> and falling in love is a really wonderful thing to do. There's, there's really, that's the high, the highest of our highs is the, the fall, falling in love, isn't it? Okay. So we either <clears throat> press it down and, that, and then it comes up and we push it out onto the world, which creates all the terrible problems that we have in the the world by seeing others as being inferior, whatever it is we see out there. Or we press, or we put it onto our bodies. They come to one of the two. You either push it out into the world, or we push it into our bodies, which then creates sickness, which then creates uh, dis-ease, right? We put it one place or the other. Fact, let me read you, if I can, just one. If you were doing the Course in Miracles from day one of this year, uh, you would today be on lesson 100, I mean, yes, 135. And so let me turn to 135 here and just read you a passage. <clears throat> the body is in need of no defense. This cannot be too often emphasized. It will be strong and healthy if the mind does not abuse it by assigning it roles it cannot fulfill. 
to purposes beyond its scope and to exalted aims which it cannot accomplish. So in terms of the course, all illness is mental illness. In terms of, um, e even though it comes out, in, comes out in the body, but there's something else that's going on inside us, that then, it, then it comes out this way. So we really want to stop and we really want to, the, what the Course is asking us to do is to really, really look. If you get angry, if you get upset, if you want to attack someone, if you want to attack anything, stop. <laughs> look very, very, very carefully. Why is this thought, why is this anger coming up in my mind? I have a, it's not a new CD, but there's a CD over there. Hold up. Uh, Word fasting. <clears throat> I just got a bunch of these in. This is a, a talk uh, that I did on word fasting, the miracle diet, which is really the and this works. Word fasting. The reason that it works is because it's a way to make. If you say certain words, and what I'm saying, if, if the word <coughs> disgusted, upset, annoyed, irritating, whatever. We've talked about this before, but if it comes up, then it's a really good place for you to stop and to look and think, where did that come from? And why did that just come out of my mouth? Is that true? Or is this, especially when it's a, a name calling, I have found another cartoon this week, which I would, should have had up here as well, where it's, it shows a, a psychologist or psychiatrist or something, uh, sitting in an office talking to a couple of uh, to a couple who are sitting on the the a couch, and he says to the couple, "You two idiots have got to stop nagging each other." <laughs> so <laughs> so here, here's the psychiatrist calling the uh, the two people that are not getting along well idiots. <laughs> oh, he said, "You two idiots have got to start calling each other names." That's it. <laughs> you two idiots have got to stop calling each other names. <laughs> it's, it's so subtle. <laughs> we just start calling names. Watch out for the name calling. That says a great deal about what's going on on a, on a deeper level, right? Okay, just to go with a few more things. The relationships we have with uh, careers and money, of course, this is a big one in terms of whether or not you feel like you're doing what you really want to be doing. or whether, Do you hate what you're doing? Would you quit it if you, if you could? Or are you uh, you're forgiven? Uh, we may forgive her too. I don't know. She found another chair. Uh, or are we, are we loving what we're doing? Are we really getting into it? And uh, are we cheating with this anything here? And then the relationship we have with things. By the relationship, with the computers, uh, all the things that annoy us and that we can get angry and distracted with, or the guy with the car that I just gave the illustration of a minute ago. That's another good example. Let's go on. There is a way of living in the world that's not here, although it seems to be. You do not change appearances, though you smile more frequently, your forehead is serene, your eyes are quiet, and the one who walks the world as you do recognize their own. So there's a way. The Course is asking us to get <clears throat> the way it calls above the battlefield. So there's a way to live in the world that's here, Although there's a way of living in the world that is not here, although it seems to be. So you're, you're here, but you're, you're not playing the game. You're not getting caught up in the soap opera and the drama and all the stuff that's going on. You see it. You see what happens on television. You watch the news. But somebody told me that his father used to yell at the, <laughs> at the news, <laughs> right, well, whatever was going on. Yeah, so... That is, uh, but you just do it dispassionately. You don't get caught in it, right? The new beginning has now become the focus of the curriculum. The goal is clear, but now you need specific methods for attaining it. The speed by which it can be reached depends on this one thing alone, your willingness to practice every step. So now we're going to go into the, these rules. One of the very first principles of the 50 miracles principles in the Course, I think it's number four or five, one of the two, says you will be told very specifically what to do. 
Now that's interesting that it uses the phrase very specifically, right? It's not general. <coughs> the guidance that is available for you, if you're willing to listen, if you're really willing, now the, in order to listen, one of the main things you've got to do, of course, is to get quiet. You can get quiet enough, long enough to really hear, but you can't get quiet enough, long enough if there's a lot of chatter going on. If there's a lot of da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da going on, then obviously we're not hearing. I was, you all know that Marianne is now uh, giving lectures here in New York on Wednesday evenings. And I've been twice. I was there, uh, Shanti and I were, went this last week. <clears throat> and I was really appreciative of the amount of, of uh, importance that she placed upon meditation and on prayer and getting quiet and just listening because this is so essential in being able to hear, and it will be very specific, right? And it'll be the right thing. You'll know when it's the right thing, because it'll be kind, it'll be gentle, it'll be loving. It will never ask you to do something that will be hurtful or attacking. Or That's why the, the tape, or the CD rather, on word fasting is to show you all of these are words that if these are part of your thought process words, you really don't want to go there because it's keeping you from being at peace. To talk about being upset. Somebody said the word, how aggravated she was, is to, I heard recently. It just so aggravates the hell out of me. Well, think about that. Where, where, what, where, where's the aggravation coming from? You know, why, why aggravated? You know, that's stop. You gotta, you say, I'm, if it aggravates you, all right, let's go on. You must change your mind, not your behavior, and this is a matter of willingness. Again, we, we, last time we talked about this a bit, the, the, you've got to be willing to do this. The course isn't easy because it takes time. You've got to be willing to do it. You've got to be willing to make them. One of the things that I noticed about Mary Ann is that a lot of times when uh, folks will raise their questions and ask, and ask a question, uh, one of the things that she'll very frequently do is she'll throw back is, are you doing the workbook? <laughs> Have you done the workbook? Have you done the lessons? Well, no, I'm getting it. Well, you <laughs> no, you got to do it. You got to be willing to actually do it. You know, and, and once you're willing to actually do it, make a commit, some commitment to, to carrying it through on it, then you begin to get results. But you can't get results until there's this willingness to actually go ahead and practice. Right. And I love to given this quote before, but it, it's so appropriate uh, from Itzhak Perlman. Uh, Amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it takes a lot of work, but it's not just getting it right. <laughs> the course is going all the way. It's going all the way home. You, 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 you have to do this work until you actually can't get it wrong. Until the mind is so aligned with the mind that you don't think anything except what is in alignment with the mind. The mind being the mind of God, of course, right? That's the way, this is why this is, of course, in mind training, and it's a complete mind training, okay? Each one, each step, I wrote, that's my word, step, will help a little every time it is attempted, and together will these steps lead you from dreams of judgment to forgiving dreams and out of pain and fear. So think about for my, if I'm using these words like upset and annoyed and irritated and da 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 da, whatever it is, that's a dream of fear going on. My friend that was aggravated, aggravating the hell out of me, right? Well, then that, there's some fear in there, right? So we, what we're trying to do is to learn how to get out of the dreams of judgment. And we're going to move to forgiving now. Forgiving dream, forgiveness is really very simple. It, it, all it means is uh, letting go. It just means letting it go. It, it, how simple can that get? It's just looking at your own insanity and saying, this is insane. And I don't need this. I don't need this insanity. I could just trust God in a case like this, right? Just let go. And as we said, that saying, let go and let God, right? It actually works, all right? 
They are not new to you, but they are more ideas than rules of thought. We're talking about the rules of decision now. To you as yet. So now we need to practice them a while until they are the rules by which you live. We seek to make them habits now. Now this is a very important point. I think it's number, uh, in the 50 miracles principles, I think it's number 50. I mean, number five, rather. Number five, which says, miracles are habits. They should not be under conscious control. Now, we live a lot by habit. The way you spend the first hour of every day is probably pretty much habituated hour, right? You do this before you do that, right? But that's okay because you've got, that's a pattern that works for you so that you remember how to, that you don't forget to brush your teeth, right? But we want to actually get into the miracle-minded type of thinking so that miracle-mindedness becomes a habit. So that forgiveness is just automatic. Forgiveness is just natural. You don't even think about, should I forgive or should I let this go? You just do it. You just do it right away. You just do it instantaneously. Just the moment you see the little irritation, comes up, you let the irritation go before it festers and turns into something that it shouldn't be. So reals for decisions. So <clears throat> decisions are continuous. Now, think about this. This is very important. Every single second of every single moment of every single day, we are making decisions. Every single second, we're making decisions. And those decisions have their effect. So, what, so I really want to look very carefully at all the decisions that I'm making and whether or not, and who's encouraging me to make these decisions. Now, let's be clear. As we go through this, the course is very clear. There are only two possibilities. So the only two possibilities is that you're listening to something we call an ego, which as a matter of fact does not exist, <laughs> which is why this whole thing is an illusion. And that's why it's the whole thing is a dream from which we will at some point awaken. And the Course is say, well, why don't I go ahead and awaken now? You know, why, why, there's a line in the Course that says, why wait for heaven? <laughs> you know, heaven is here. Heaven, why, am, why am I putting off heaven? I could see heaven now. Not, of course, it's not for a single second need you wait. Right? All right. So, do you, decisions are continuous. You do not always know when you're making them. With a little practice, we can begin to have the right kind of choices that we're making. So this is a, a course in mind training. We're training the mind to go the right way. This course is what it calls wrong-mindedness and right-mindedness. So we're just developing right or healthy-mindedness or sane-mindedness or reasonable-mindedness. Those are all sort of the same things. But think about the kind of day you want. <clears throat> this is what uh, Yasko was talking about. This is the way we should get started every day. I hope that some of you are doing the workbook, uh, and if you haven't done it, that you will do it, and even if you've done it once or a dozen times, that you still kind of let that become, and Marianne, I noticed, emphasized, and I would say exactly the same thing. It's uh, the first thing, the first thing, right? Before, the ter before you turn on the computer, right? Before the computer gets turned on, Read the lesson for the day and let that be there. You know, and then maybe meditate about that. Have five minutes of quiet after you've read, read it or whatever it is. Then you can turn your computer on, unless you turn it on to get the Course in Miracles. But, <laughs> but think about the day you want. Tell yourself there is a way in which this very day can happen just like that. Then try again to have the day you want. Now, this, the, these lessons are going to be these five, we're going to go through these very, very quickly, actually. They're very repetitive. It's kind of like saying the same thing over and over again. The Course is very repetitive. It keeps saying the same thing over and over again, uh, in part to help us begin to get into the habit. <laughs> to develop a habit, you have to keep doing the same thing over and over again. So the Course is simply trying to, get to, to do the same thing over and over again until we get it right. So. The outlook starts with today, I will make no decisions by myself. This is your major problem now. You still make up your mind and then decide to ask what you should do. 
Now, this is very important. <laughs> because first, you make up your own mind. First, you know, first we go to the ego, and we get the ego's opinion. And, and then we go to, to, to Jesus and ask him if he will confirm that. <laughs> right. Throughout the day, at any time you think of it, and have a quiet moment for reflection, tell yourself again. So this is, this is what I mean by being repetitive. Right? One of the things you might do is, as you're doing the workbook lesson is kind of write it on a little yellow pad or, or do something where you can, you know, you, you pull it out of your billfold. Why, golly, there it is on the, like just right there, and you just, that's not one, but it's just an example of what you could do. Right? It's right there on, the, on your billfold, or it's right there where you can repeat it, or you're standing on line at the bank, or you're sitting at a stoplight, or whatever you're doing. You know, what is the thought? that I really want to be thinking right now. Can I review? Let me review this. This is a good time to review, right? Throughout the day, at any time you think of it, and have a quiet moment of reflection, tell yourself again the kind of day you want, the feeling you would have, the thing you want to happen to you, and things you would experience, and say, if I make no decision by myself, this is the day that will be given me. Now, again, this is very, very important. There's only these two possible thoughts. It's only either with, with the mind aligned with the ego or with the Holy Spirit, following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You want to get so good at listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and following the guidance of the Holy Spirit that that is the only voice that you hear because it's the only voice that's real. Now, this is very scary to the ego. It may seem very scary to you because you think, well, now I've lost, I will have lost my independence of thought. That's not true. <laughs> this is where it gets really exciting. Your thought and the thought that the Holy Spirit is sharing with you is your real thought. This is the true thought. This is the thought that will get you back home again to God. And it may sound a little silly to say this at this point, but ultimately you can't help but think in alignment with the mind of God. You can't help but think in alignment with the Holy Spirit. And if you do so, you will be feeling, you'll feel good. Just as you know when you're feeling bad that your thoughts are not going in the right direction. We know when we're feeling guilty, for example. We know when we're going off course. And that's why the, the task is to stop right away and ask for realignment, to refocus. Go on. So three, so this is a repetitive, I said it's repetitive. So remember once again the day you want and recognize that something has occurred that's not part of it. If you have an attack thought, let's say you have an attack thought, or you have a very judgmental <coughs> thought, a projective thought, just stop. The moment you say, oh, this is a judgmental thought. This is an attacking thought. This is, not a, this is a not a kind thought that I am thinking about some other person, let's say. Right? Then realize that you have asked a question by yourself and must have set an answer in your terms. Then say, I have no question. I forgot what to decide. And let's go on. If you are so unwilling to receive, you cannot even let your question go. You can begin to change your mind with this. And this is very important. At least I can decide I do not like what I feel. At least I can decide that. At least I, I got that much. I don't like what I'm feeling right now. I don't like the thought that I've got right now, right? This much is obvious and paves the way for the next easy step. So this is similar to Bill Tedford turning to Helen Schuckman in the very beginning of the course and saying there must be another way. You just recognize, I don't, I, this arguing that's going on, that, that's what he was saying in their office, this isn't right. There's got to be another way. There's got to be a way that, my God, the two psychologists at Columbia can't figure out how to get along with each other. <laughs> and, and, and with the other people in the department, for that matter as well, there's much ego games going on there as any place else. Come on, you're supposed to be people to help other people figure out 
<laughs> and you can't get it figured out, all right? So what just so we just stop. So at least I don't I can decide I don't like the way I feel now. All right. And then having decided that you do not like the way you feel, what could be easier than to continue with and so I hope I have been wrong. Now this is again a very important point in the course. It's really a good thing to be wrong. It really is. It's a really a good thing to recognize that you're wrong. It's really a good thing to recognize that you don't like the way that you feel. And until you're willing to do that, you know, because, because until the way you're willing to do that, no change is going to occur. So if you say that you're going to find yourself into an, a little argument with some, someone, right? So it's a really good point to stop and think, why would I argue about this thing? I noticed something happened with my wife and I recently. It was always just something so tiny. It was over a fact. A little f it's ridiculous to argue over a fact. You mean like, who was the star in that movie? I was so, no, I thought the star was so-and-so. No, no, it was so-and-so. No. That's, what the world? <laughs> Why? Who's right? I don't care. Okay, you're right. You know, be willing to be wrong, happily wrong. You know, because what's what, is it more is it more important that I've got this the answer than you have, or <laughs> is it more important that we just get along with each other and that we're happy with each other? You know, yeah. forget about being right. Yeah, you know? much better to be wrong. And if you're really right, it'll be discovered later on, and it won't make any difference. You know, right? <laughs> okay. Now you have reached the turning point because it has occurred to you that you will gain if what you have decided is not so. Until this point is reached, you will believe your happiness depends on being right. And you may remember a couple of times back, do you want to be right or happy? It's a basic point in the course. Right? And of course, it's much better to be happy than it is to be right. That's why I say, please, uh, just let it go and be wrong. But this means reason have you now, but this much reason have you now attained, you would be better off if you were wrong. Actually, you're much more peaceful to be wrong. It's much real, actually, you know, let, let, let the other one be right. You know, it's so much easier. So, this, we're going to, we'll finish these and then we'll take a break. This tiny grain of wisdom will suffice to take you further. The tiny grain of wisdom is that you're wrong. All right? You are now you are not coerced, but merely hope to get a thing you want. And now you can say in perfectly on in perfect honesty, I want another way to look at this. When you say I want another way to look at this, you are really speaking to the Holy Spirit. And you're really saying, Holy Spirit, help me to see this differently. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit can help you to see it differently once you get to the point of saying, I really want another way to look at this. Right? Now you're inviting the Holy Spirit in. Come in, help me make the right choice. Help me make the right decision, which is often just letting it go. Right? And finally up to seven. This final step is but acknowledgement of lack of opposition to be helped. It is a statement of an open mind, not certain yet, but willing to be shown. Perhaps there is another way to look at this. What can I lose by asking? Or asking the Holy Spirit, right? Let's talk about open-mindedness for just a moment. So open-mindedness is really this sort of this, this state of... Uh, Non, it's non-prejudicial. In the Manual for Teachers of A Course in Miracles, there are 50, 50, <laughs> there are 10. <laughs> Mixing up with the 50 principles with the, with the 10 now. So there are 10 characteristics of a teacher of God. Right? There is an order to these 10 characteristics. There's a reason why one is one and two is two and three and three, and, and, it, and it tells you, you go through it, you'll see that how one builds on the other. And by the way, just as a reminder, number one is trust. 
And what you're saying when you trust, you really trust in God. You're really trusting to follow God's guidance. You're really saying, I will do. That's what you're doing, Francis. You're really trusting. If I just go this way that I'm being told to follow, it's going to work. But I've got to trust. I've got to trust, right? And I won't go through all those. At another time, it would be fun to do that. But the last characteristic of the teacher of God, and it says so in the book, it says, the last characteristic a teacher of God develops is open-mindedness. What it means by open-mindedness it means total open-mindedness. Completely open-minded, so there's no prejudice. There's no projection. There's no analysis. There's no interpretation. There's no right. There's no wrong. There just is. You know, one of the wonderful parts about having a, a baby <laughs> in the house is there's nothing there. By that I mean there's no pre there's just there's no language yet, right? We've just got these big loving eyes. <laughs> Looking, 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 looking. Not even any words. There's no words. There's nothing. And there's that something about that that causes uh, the rest of us to uh, fall in to those big eyes and, and just be receptive. It's just totally open, right? Because there's no room for it. They haven't learned. They don't even have an I or a me yet. There's no name yet even. There's nothing. There's just this presence, just the presence, right? It must be clear that it is easier to have a happy day if you prevent unhappiness from entering it at all, but this takes practice and the rules that will protect you from the ravages of the spirit. So we're again back to practice. Practice, practice, practice. We could keep doing this, keep doing this, keep doing this in order for it to work. You will not make decisions by yourself, whatever you decide, for they are made with idols or with God. There are only two choices. Another word for idols here are with the ego. There's only two choices. I'm either making it with the idols or with the ego or with God, one of the two. And you ask help of Antichrist or Christ. Christ is the mind of God. Antichrist is anything that's not that. So it's anything other than that. Right, and which you choose will will join with you and tell you what to do. This is the kind of day you want to have. Okay, we're up to freedom of will, which is another section, and it's a good time to have our first break. Thank you. <laughs>